Okay, so today what we're going to do, thank you, Isaac, for the arrow. We're going to um, continue on the story from last time. So last time we went through karate uh, and taekwondo and the other martial arts taekwondo could have been based upon, like taekyon, for example. And we went through like what's called the world taekwondo side, kukiwon, and um, International Taekwondo Federation, ITF. So the three different branches of Taekwondo all together. So today we're going to pick off, kick off from where we, we st stopped last week. And then we're going to focus on Changdo Kwan and Changdo Taekwondo in, in a little bit more detail. But first we're going to run through a little bit of terminology because um, that way it will make, I think, a little bit more sense. All right, so in terms of terminology, the Kwan, uh, that word literally means training hall. Yeah, um, what, what it's kind of evolved to mean as well is like a school or an association. All right, so, uh, so Chengdu Kwan, for example, is Blue Wave School, right? Um, the next word is Kwan Jangnim, and Kwan Jangnim has like two levels of meanings, and that's sometimes a little bit confusing because there's a very big difference in terms of how important somebody is um, with these two different levels. So one, one meaning of Konjangnim is someone who owns a school. So like for Steve and myself, we run Chengdu Taekwondo. So in theory, we're, we're Konjangnim, right? But like at the really senior level, or the senior meaning of Konjangnim would be uh, like Grandmaster Park Man, who is the head of Chengdu Kwan across the world, right? So it's the same word used for both instances, but one of them is like significantly more um, responsibility, I think, compared to someone who owns like a small dojong. Um, the next word is sabom. So sabom doesn't necessarily mean master, which is quite interesting. So normally sabom means actually just uh, like a, a model teacher, right? But in English, we normally translate it to master. Um, in terms of rank, people who are fourth dan and higher, so sadan and higher, uh, they're called sabom or sabonim. When you get to uh, seventh dan and up, then you can be called like grandmaster, right? So sometimes you'll see people referred to as grandmaster. Uh, that's because they are higher dan, like eighth, ninth dan. I think it's actually eighth, ninth dan, not seventh dan. Um, and someone who's an instructor, let's say you're first to third dan and you're an instructor, then uh, there's two different words for it. One's kyosanim and the other one is songsingnim. So normally in school, if you're in school and you have a, a like school teacher, they normally get called songsingnim. Uh, Kyosanim is not so common apparently in schools, but more in universities. But they actually uh, mean the same thing from what I've been told. Like, you know, I'm not native Korean speaker. So Emma, Alex, if you want to correct me, feel free to correct me. Um, so... You know, a quick rundown in terms of terminology there. So, um, back in episode one last week, we talked about how Changde Kwan was formed. So, Grandmaster Lee Won Kuk, Lee Won Kuk, he, you know, went to Japan, studied Shodokan Karate um, after the Japanese, or during the Japanese occupation of Korea. And 1944, he started, uh, he was allowed by the Japanese to start the school. Chongde Kwan in Korea. And, um, you know, we, we talked about how that was the start of Taekwondo. Um, and Taekwondo officially was named, you know, like 1953, I think it was. Now, after that was formed, Chongde Kwan, um, what happened was the Master Lee then went back to Japan. Um, I think. You know, there's lots of political stuff happening in Korea at the time. So J the Japanese had left. 
Um, there was a new president who had taken over Korea. He was very much a military um, president and really, you know, like a dictator, um, but did a lot of good things in terms of bringing Korea into like an industrialized um, nation. And uh, when Grandmaster Lee went back to Japan, um, he left the school in charge. Other, other people ran the school and they started teaching or they were continued the training. Um, and then from there, like a lot of different offshoots of uh, Taekwondo started forming or in, back in the day still wasn't called Taekwondo yet. So this is where we get a lot of different other Kwans. So there's uh, Kwans like Judo Kwan, uh, which is David's original school. Uh, there's Chongmu Kwan. There are, oh, there's a whole uh, Mudo Kwan, Songmu Kwan. And um, there's a second Chongmu Kwan as well. But it's spelt with a J-U instead of a C-H-U. So there's like a related one. Altogether, there were nine. Okay, so nine original Kwans. And they operated as like separate schools kind of like old time martial arts kung fu movies. I don't know if you guys have ever watched them yet, but if you haven't, you kind of should because in the old like 1980s, 1990s Hong Kong martial arts movies, what would happen is like one school would go and like challenge the other school and they go fight each other. Um, and I'm sure that's, that's kind of what happened between the different Kwans as well. And in around like 1970, um the you know the term taekwondo was really getting um more traction so you know people had stopped kind of uh wanting to call wanting to use the old names like kong sudo and that kind of stuff and 1972 they had done a lot of work to unify the taekwondo terminology and pumse now by 1978, um, that had all been kind of consolidated. And this is when, you know, Kukiwon and World Taekwondo and the Korean Taekwondo Federation started uh, to play a lot more significance and a lot more importance. So this um, that's on the screen now is something that the nine different Kwanjang-nim of the nine different Kwans, they all signed this agreement. And basically this agreement says, we're gonna dissolve the Kwans and we're going to unite under the Kukiwon banner. And, um, you know, and we won't kind of follow the old ways of the Kwans anymore. We will all just run the Kukiwon style Taekwondo. All right, so this was done in about 1978. Um, so theoretically, I was they signed all the different Kwans signed that declaration that you saw on the previous screen. It's August 1978. Um, and then that's when all the Kwans were meant to dissolve. So, you know, up until a little while ago, um, the Kwans themselves were actually just more like friendship organizations, like membership organizations. And um, they didn't have that much significance, apparently. Right, and, uh, supposedly didn't have much significance in how Taekwondo ran, um, but that's kind of not really true, because you know Taekwondo Kwan still exists, um, and and um, we were just talking before the heads of Gukiwon. Every few years they change which kind of Kwan. Um, is running cookie one. So sometimes it's a Chongda Kwan person, sometimes it's a Changmu Kwan person, sometimes it's a Jiro Kwan person uh, who is the president of cookie one. So uh, there still seems to be a lot of influence that the, the old Kwan system has. Uh, Chongda Kwan masters, you know, spread out all across the world. Um, being the first school, it has a bit of a advantage because, you know, it has a bit more time to train masters up. Um, so Chongda Kwan is like pretty big in Southeast Asia area, um, America, Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnam War is a very kind of um, important avenue, I guess, for Taekwondo to get spread around the world. Because what happened was 
the Korean sent a lot of the Taekwondo masters to Vietnam and a lot of the masters trained like the American troops in hand-to-hand -hand combat when they were over there. So my master, Master So, uh, Master Sa in Korean, he was one of those masters. He was sent into Vietnam in, during the Vietnam War and he trained up a lot of the American soldiers. Um, then after that, he went through Southeast Asia, taught there and then came to Australia. So the, the masters, you know, travel all around the world and, you know, keeping the, these kind of links alive. Uh, the Changnokon office still exists. So even though theoretically, you know, the Kwans were dis, uh, disbanded back in 1978, there's a very small little office in an area of Seoul called Yoksam, um, which is one station up from Gangnam Station. And inside a building there, there's uh, the Changnokon office. And, um, you know, when I go back to Korea, we always go back to the office. It's like when you go back to your home country, you go visit your relatives. It's the same thing. When I go back to Korea, I go back to the Changnokon office and, you know, say hi to Grand Grandmaster Park. Um, and then we sit around and we look at some old photos sometimes if we're lucky and we get to hear some stories, which is pretty cool. Um, so there are at least four types of Chonokon schools, though, which is quite interesting. Um, there's still some old school Korean karate. So if you, um, I, I guess, you know, if you see some videos on YouTube and then it says Chonokon and then you look at it and you don't recognize what they're doing, that's because it's, you know, one of these four different variants is possibly happening here. So there's old school Korean karate that, that is still taught, largely in America, I think. Um, there's Taekwondo, which teach the Changhong patterns. The Changhong patterns are the patterns which are used in ITF, right? But before they were used in ITF, they were um, taught in, in just general Taekwondo as well for Chongnukwan and the other school, Orokwan. It's very military style. Um, the third type is uh, Changnokon schools that only teach Taeguk patterns, right? And, um, you know, there's quite a lot of them in the world as well. And there are some, which is like R1, which where we teach both Changhon and Taeguk patterns, because uh, we want to still try to keep the links back to kind of the earlier, more military martial art style of Taekwondo. Um, so far, there have been four Kwanjangnim um, of the whole Chonokwan, right? So the first one, Lee Wong Guk, who is the um, original founder. So behind us, you guys, are, is very small. But you see, like, you know, there's like something hanging on the wall, right? The Chinese letters hanging on the wall in our dojang. So that is a print, but it was written by Lee Wong Guk originally. So the, it, it was written by the original founder of Changnokon. And what it says is it says, purify your heart through Taekwondo, right? Um, so that was given to like, you know, I went to the, the summer camp a couple of years ago as a, as a Chang Changnokon master, we have to go back to the summer camp once every three years. Otherwise we kind of like, we can't call ourselves Changnokon. That's one of these, uh, a new rule that was set up um, a few years ago. So um, I went to the summer camp back in 2019 and um, all of the masters were given one of these prints and that was to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Changnokon back then. So it's really cool. So we're, we're lucky enough to have this, you know, print of a uh, calligraphy done by the, the founder of, of Changnokon. Um, second master was Sondong. Uh, Son Dok Sung. Um, the third Kwanjang name is Grandmaster Um. And Grandmaster Um is super, super important in the development of Taekwondo in general, right? So he did a lot of work, um, you know, starting up or being involved with starting up the KTA, Korean Taekwondo Association, did a lot of work being involved studying up Gukiwon itself. He was also one of Gukiwon's um, presidents in the past, and um, he uh, 
set a lot of the rules that we use in sparring in Kyorugi these days as well. So his nickname was the God of Sidekicks. So he was apparently very, very good at like long range sidekick. Um, it's like sliding sidekick, super fast, super strong. Like, kind of like Bruce Lee style is what I imagine. There are no videos that I can find. So um, all I can do is imagine. Um, the fourth and the current Grandmaster is Grandmaster Park Hei Man. So Grandmaster Park um, is, is very, very well known as well for lot, mostly for two things. One is he trained um, the presidential bodyguards. So in Korea, in the, they call, you know, America is the White House. The Korea president lives in the Blue House, okay? Um, because the tiles on the roof are blue. So it's called the Blue House. So we're in, back in a little few, like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they used to have one instructor from each different martial art to teach the presidential bodyguards. So Grandmaster Park, he was selected as the master to teach the presidential bodyguards Taekwondo, right? So he did that for 18 years. So that's one thing he's very well known for. And the second one he's very well known for is he's one of the five original masters who were involved in creating the Teguk Pumse. So Teguk 4, um, those of you who know both Changhon and Teguk will kind of realize that Teguk 4 is quite similar to a Changhon pattern. Uh, and that's because it's one of the ones that Grandmaster Park um, created and it was one of the ones that were accepted. I think the second Pumse that he created was Tebek. But I, I kind of forgot which one it was. I'm pretty sure it's Tebek. I've asked some, one of my other master's uh, friends to, to help me remember. But basically, he, he created five different Pumse. Um, they were submitted into the group of the five other masters who also created their Pumse's. Uh, and then Grandmaster Park has uh, two of his got selected to be the ones that we still do today. Right. So Grandmaster Park is. Um, classed as like a living legend or living um, cultural asset, um, which is like quite crazy. It's, it's really cool. Um, so on the right, this Taekwondo lineage, um, this is on the wall in the Dojang. Some of you guys may have read it, some of you might not have. But basically it runs through the story of, you know, our masters and our master's masters. And we're quite lucky we've got like quite a direct link, right? So Lee, Lee Wong-guk, who is the original founder of Chung Kwan, he trained Grandmaster Um. Grandmaster Um trained Grandmaster Park, right? Um, these two masters were like quite close to eight. I think they're four years apart, but they, they met in the army. Um, and then through that, you know, that's when Master Park started training under Master Um. um and Master Park trained Master Sa, who is my master. Uh, master he's also um, related. So Master Sa's wife is the niece of Grandmaster Park as well. So Steve, Steve's grand uncle is Grandmaster Park, which is like crazy talk. He's like a bloodline direct um, relation. Um, to one of like the original gods, basically, of, of Taekwondo. Um, and Grandmaster Shin um, is the master that uh, Grandmaster Sa introduced me to a few years ago uh, when, you know, when I went to Korea. Um, and Master Shin is now, you know, the, my master who, who I go and train with when we can go to Korea. So these photos are from like that year. So this is like a crazy martial arts story right here. One year I was like, hmm, Grandmaster Su is getting um, a little bit older and I think he's gonna go to Korea less, right? And I've never been to Korea with Grandmaster Su before. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to Korea. Um, Master Su was going to Korea at the same time. It was like January. I said, Master Su, when are you going to Korea? He was like, oh, I'm gonna at the end of January. I said, okay, cool. I'll book a plane ticket and go in the same, like, I'll arrive the same day as you. 
Um, so I went there. I was on Korean Air. My sister was on Asiana, and they landed different times. So I got there. I got there earlier. I was like, oh, cool. I should be able to see him at the airport when he arrives. But I couldn't, right? So um, my sister knew I was going there. And then he was like, okay, I'll give you a call. And then we'll arrange to like meet at Cookie One and stuff. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm waiting there in my hotel room for basically like four days, I think three or four days. And then one day Master Sir calls up and is like, hey, okay, go to Cookie One tomorrow. I'm like, oh, okay then. All right, I'll see you there at 11. So I go there at 11 o'clock. I'm like waiting around outside. Lucky I've been to Korea a few times and to Seoul. So I kind of like know my way around a little bit. But I'm standing outside. And then this master here in the bottom uh, right, his, his name is Grandmaster Im. And he's the secretary general of Chongdukwan. He comes outside of Gukiwan and he points to me and says, hey, you, Hoju. Hoju is Australia in Korean, right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm Australian. Uh, he's like, okay, come. I'm like, All right, okay, go. Because Master Im doesn't really speak English. Um, so then I go like with this random master uh, who I didn't know was a master. And he was like, okay, we're going here. So he, I go into the car, which is totally unsafe. Don't do this, okay? If you're ever in this situation, don't do this. Um, but I got in the car and then he drives me off to Yoksam, to the, um, to the Chongdukon office, right? And then, then we go upstairs um, and then Master Sai is there, Grandmaster Um is there, Grandmaster Park is there, everyone is there. And then that's when I met Grandmaster Shin for the first time, right? So that's like very like crazy story, crazy story. But it's like those old martial arts movies where like the student has to sit in the rain for like three days um, until the master allows them to tr come and train in. Luckily, I didn't have to sit in the rain. I was sitting in a hotel room. So it's like much more comfortable. Um, but it's kind of like modern day equivalent of that. But uh, these two photos were taken, you know, during that, that day. Uh, and when I was putting this together yesterday, I was thinking this is the last time that all these masters were together. Um, which is kind of sad, but like, you know, I was kind of lucky that I've captured that, captured that moment, right? Because Master Sun never went back to Korea after that trip. Um, so it was, you know, very lucky that I was able to go at that time. So that's the time I met Grandmaster Um, probably, I think for the first time, I was lucky enough to maybe meet him once after that. Yes, I met him one more time. I went back the next year, met Master Um again. Grandmaster Park had been to Australia a few times. Um, I was lucky enough to do some training sessions with him. They were really, really good. Um, but I was too young. I didn't really understand, like, you know, how lucky I was back then. Um, and this restaurant is a really good restaurant. So if we ever get to go to Korea um, and we go to the Chungnakon office, we would just, like, go behind the Chungnakon office. And then this restaurant is, like, duck bossom. Um, so bosom is like, uh, you get the meat and you put it in lettuce and some like kimchi and stuff, and then you eat it, but it's a duck version. Um, so there's a restaurant in, in New York called Momofuku, which basically is like famous because they have a version of this, but like this restaurant is like better than Momofuku because I've eaten both. So I can guarantee you it's better. Um, yeah, so that's really, really cool. Um, so yeah, that's the lineage, right? That's, that's kind of like our family tree. Um, you know, so somewhere, some of one of our students at some point in time, hopefully is going to be the next Kwanjang Nim of uh, Chongdo Taekwondo. And, you know, who knows? It could be one of you guys. That'd be really cool. Um, so as I said, every... You know, pre-COVID, we don't know what's going to happen after, but hopefully we'll be able to do this again. Um, there's a summer camp. So normally it's around now, July. So normally I'd be getting ready to go to, to Korea. Um, I've been to three out of the four summer camps so far. And uh, like, it's good to train with all the different masters from all around the world. And sometimes we get to do crazy things like, you know, we randomly entered a local competition. Um, we didn't know we were entering competition. Master Shin is like, hey, 
come, we're going to, to this place, bring your stuff. All right, so you just always bring your stuff. If you ever come on these one of the trips with me, you just bring your stuff everywhere. Bring a double, bring a belt, just every time, just put it in your bag. So we got there, we're like, okay, you're doing a competition today. I'm like, what the devil? Anyway, so we randomly did this competition with all these like um, local Korean, I think they were like kids as well. So it was like a school level competition, but it was fun. Um, we got to train with like this lady up here. She's um, world champion from 2018, Pumse. If you saw the America's Got Talent um, uh, demonstration with the World Taekwondo team, she's in that team. So she was in uh, that world, you know, that team that was on, on YouTube and TV and everything just like three weeks ago. Um, she is the granddaughter of Grandmaster Um uh, as well. So, you know, another, another one of those crazy stories. Um, and then in here, you got Grandmaster Park in the gold. Uh, next to him is Grandmaster Lee, who's also super, super famous. Um, he is like one of the Kyungi University professors in Taekwondo. Kyungi University is one of like the, the best Taekwondo universities. Um, in the world. And then there's this like a random picture of the food that I eat uh, <laughs> over in Korea. This is Jokbal. Jokbal is like pig trotter. It's like so tasty. This one's like super, super, super soft. Um, it's really, really good. Um, yeah, so that's like very short Taekwondo story for today. Um, but that's kind of like the history of, of our school. Um, next time you're in the dojang, feel free to like read through this poster because it's got a lot of information about you know what the different masters did and how they contributed to to taekwondo and um, you know to where we are today. It's like kind of sad, but it's it's also kind of good that a lot of the old masters contributed a lot during war times in military style. Um, cause that's really the essence of what our Taekwondo is, right? It's really more, you know, founded on that kind of military purpose of Taekwondo. Um, these days, luckily, touch wood, there aren't any wars. Um, so, you know, the masters these days aren't kind of as hardcore as the old masters. Um, you know, these days, most masters can just claim that they're very good at competition. Uh, which is good. I think it's lucky. It's kind of shown how we progress as a society, right? We shouldn't have to be at war all the time. Um, but yeah, some of these old masters, very hardcore, like hardcore fighters. And it's like life or death fighting. It's not like they're fighting for a medal, right? It's very, very different, <laughs> very different style. Um, but yeah, next time you're in the dojang, have a look um, at, at the poster. Um, and remember like some of this information, including the food um, could be part of your higher level tests like red black belt um, later on. Cool. So that's pretty much it. Very short one today. Um, hope it was informative. Um, if, any, if you have any questions, feel free to, feel free to ask.